we're yeah we're like two minutes early tonight guys welcome to iso buddies so as you can see i got my new co-star here we're not super friends yet so she's a little antsy but we have a little tub for her to sit in and uh with some succulents and she's happy this is bingo the northern blue tongue skink from northern australia actually from aunt sandy skinks if you go to aunt sandy skinks uh there she is you can get 25 percent off with the code iso buddies okay guys like look at this girl look at this girl that's a huge value 25 percent off of these guys is no joke like actually i don't know what they cost for real so <laughs> maybe a couple hundred bucks i don't know so 25 percent off a couple hundred bucks that's like 50 bucks minimum that's a great value um yeah look at that like, there she is there's aunt sandy right there so you know who to contact and there's one of bingo's uh probably her parents i don't know yeah she's pretty antsy we're gonna put her back in a minute so she just ate a little bit ago and that yeah see that's not how to hold them you want to support them you want to support their body but you see how yeah you see how she's being just look at her tongue at me she's angry don't spray poop do not spray poop right now there she is so happy there's that tongue there we go all right so i'm gonna put her back three to five hundred look at that guys so that is like 75 dollars to what to what 125 that's huge yeah she did eat just about a half an hour ago so and then again because i'm trying to test out how much she eats so we'll talk about her in a minute um i'm gonna bring scott on so scott ellicott you guys have seen him before that's water okay good <laughs> that's you see how i test right there um that's how you do it so uh scott ellicott you guys have seen him before we've talked about ants before today i'm getting a lot of questions about sheila and how i started and how it began we have some well i have some good um visual aids for you and uh to see my other colonies how they're doing i call them colonies but they're we'll get into what they're called for real when they're in the in the first stages so but we're going to go from catching ants to sheila okay we're going to go all the way up to sheila i don't know uh scott lives in canada so they grow a lot slower there everybody hibernates so he doesn't have the opportunity to have them just lay and lay and lay eggs all year round sheila's like three years old so not even i don't even think she's even three years old hey moon hey kate hey sandy kate dijon that's how you say it if you're a jugloni. Aunt Aunt is here, I think, or was here. First time in a while. Cool. Oh, Russ might be back. All right, good. So let me bring our boy in, my very favorite Canadian. Don't tell Coral. Coral's not here yet. She doesn't know. All right, or Biggs. Don't tell Biggs either. I met Biggs in person. He's officially my favorite. But Scott. <laughs> Scott. How's it going? <laughs> I was going to say, I am out. I wasn't going to be there. With that, that I saw you reach for the mouse and I had to pull you in first. Um, I'm real good at like deciding or figuring out when my guests are about to be like, this isn't for me. Uh, <laughs> it happens more often than you think. So first off, uh, my hair looks amazing. So just to, it's back. It's back. You guys, I can comb it back now. It looks hand tossed. I don't know if you can see that or not. That's no conditioner. That's just natural 49 year old Josh soon to be 49. Um, Moon, you're not in Canada, are you? I don't even know Moon's real name. I've been <laughs> honest to God, I don't know his real name. Um, I've seen his show. He doesn't really say his own name much. Oh, there's Coral. Shh. Don't tell her. Don't tell her, Scott. Are you drinking cocoa or is that just like Bailey's? It's uh, tea. <laughs> Just, Shy? just tea. Uh, and decaf tea. Decaf tea. All right. It gets cloudy when they take the calf out. Uh, yeah. So you can see Scott's legit. He's wearing his Ants Canada t-shirt. He's got – Ants Canada kind of started everybody that's in Ants, I think. If you've been in Ants Pretty in the much. last five years, yeah, that's how you got started. And then at some point, you just totally disregard Mikey. Like, he's just entertainment now. So <laughs> – yeah, he's even beyond entertainment for me, but I still I, I like some of his uh, founding equipment, and we'll get into that a little further. So I don't mind wrapping his name, but I'll drop a few other names as we talk tonight as well. Perfect, like Mac. So you can see behind Scott is a <laughs> like catalog. Don't look. Yeah, don't look yet. That's a catalog of Tar Heel ant setups. Yeah, I, I need um, I need like a sheet. 
so I can uh, do a grand reveal next time. Next time, yeah, put a sheet up there, yeah. like your old Star Wars sheets from when you're living at home. Um, oh, guys, this is the first show. This is the first show I have a landline hooked up to the phone, like it's an actual physical cord that, to the phone that goes from my computer to the modem. And then there's a phone. There's not a real landline phone. Um, but we'll see how we do for connection issues. Uh, Wally convinced me to get on it. And I've only had the cord in my house for a year. So maybe longer, maybe longer than a year. So we're good. Um, yeah, the landline. I, does anyone call it that anymore? God. Yeah. Up here oh, in Canada, we do, eh? <laughs> yeah, but it's still 1996 yeah, in Canada. So. <laughs> no, I think we're in year 2001. You're still waiting on Y2K oh, over there, there, I think. Yeah, Coral's my other favorite Canadian. Um, let's see. So first we need to talk about springtails. Do you love springtails? Do I love springtails? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all right. Well, if you ever want to get cool springtails and you're in America, you should check out Springtails US. Springtails.us. Not only so if you're are they quality Canada, springtails. You're, you're yeah. Well, you should start breeding your own. You should start collecting your own. It's not hard. While you're out getting ants, you use the same aspirator to get them. So, see, I don't love them hot. because I had them in this, and they just die. Oh, so springtails and oh, there's a few living. They're starting to do okay. All the springtail people go. are gonna be like, "You're doing this wrong," but I'm an ant guy, not a springtail guy. Yep, is that just leaves in water? It's uh, wood chips with a little bit of water, maybe a little too much water. No, they're fine. They're hydrophobic, so they float. There you go. Aspirator. That's the equipment that we're looking for, guys. I have that exact model, I think. So I got this one, Tar Heel Lance. Go figure. Okay. I think, I mean, I feel like he's your impersonal sponsor. Um, but if you don't want to have to catch your own in America, you can just go to springtails.us and another... Isobuddy's code, 10% off your order. Okay, guys? He's got a lot of cool stuff coming out this week. That's all my sponsors tonight, I swear. I'm sorry. I got all my commercials out. Um, but those are the two places you want to go. I mean, Bingo's awesome. Springtails are awesome. Um, other than that, everybody's awesome. We got Green Jedi Monkeys here. Major's here. No such thing as too much water. That's not true. That is not true. <laughs> it's Springtails. Tell that to the ones that are floating dead and drowned. <laughs> They probably drowned after well, after they died. After they died, it happened. Um, but yeah, let's get into ants. Let's talk about some ants. It's minute six, and we haven't really talked about it. So when you're looking for ants, you need to know your area. What is your uh, go-to resource to find out, like, what's in your area, when flights happen, that starter information. What's your website that you go to? Um, more so for the for the biomes and specific areas, I'll look at the antwiki.org. Okay. It's more it's more of a web. It's a very sciencey website. It's more for uh, professional identifications, but it does break down into kind of the nitty gritty. It shows area maps where specific species will be found, so you can look in your area. It's actually a lot more. Um, what would the word be? I want to say, I guess, inclusive, not inclusive, but detailed, oddly enough, for Canada, where it breaks it down by province. With the Americas, it breaks it down by uh, region, like climate zones, more yeah. so than yeah. actual states. So I, I find it very useful so I can find what's specific to my, my province. And then it'll even break it down to if it's in the southern, mid Midwest, Northwest, etc. Uh, it's a lot easier for me too to narrow down species because we probably only have about 100, don't quote me on that, different species where in the states as a whole you have thousands of different species. We do, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. So Ant Wiki for sure, it'll break it down. You can kind of narrow it down to your specific region and see what is available. And great, uh, another great website would be um, I don't use it. I use it for a couple care sheets. <laughs> but it's, uh, what was it? You quoted it a while ago. See, I can't even think of it oh, now. Crap. But I it, probably uh, did. Forum. 
It's an ant forum. Yeah, I'll have to find it. It's a uh, for it's escaping me. I want to say it's formicarium or something. Uh, I'll think of it. I'll, I'll yell it out later when it comes to me. Um, yeah. The forum that I use. Yes, there's another one too that is um, iNaturalist. iNaturalist.com. Well, I know this is good because it shows all the local observations and you can narrow it again by your area. So yeah. you'll see both from actual entomologists, myrmecologists, and just everyday citizens like you and me can post yep. their findings. And you can also post your, like I said, you can post your findings and you can get it professionally identified as well. Yep. And then, yep. yeah, a lot of, a lot of my ant keeping and my experience and know-how is just from doing it as a kid, since a kid. Yeah. So I've kind of I've kind of learned the the times, the the regions in around my city here, Edmonton, and in Alberta, when I can find ants flying, I can find their colonies, kind of know where to look, okay. and what I'm looking for. A lot of it's just come trial and error, and just I guess from being a kid and being outdoorsy, right? So many of us have started this off as kids. Yeah. Like I, sadly, I can't tell you how many. I was a before the internet kid. So you had to hit the library and usually the books there were old and you didn't get to the library before everything you collected in a shoebox died or in a jar that you left out in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well I had a book. It was uh, actually a local uh, local writer, producer and entomologist at our local university local. I'm saying local a lot. Uh, John Acorn He's that's his actual name is John Acorn. Is he related to Johnny Appleseed? John Acorn is Canadian. No. Appleseed is American. Yeah, and his show, The Nature Nut, <laughs> was on TV all the time, so I'd watch that. I have his book still, uh, Insects of Alberta, and okay. very vague information onto all the different species, but enough for as a kid. It got me totally into the ants because he went into detail in their nests and how they interact. Yeah, and from then on, just yeah. I spent all my days outside just finding their nests and seeing what they did. Is this it, Formaculture? I think that's it, right? Formaculture. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, Formaculture.com. Yeah. So that's a great forum. Like I said, I don't really use it just because I, I don't really spend a lot of time on the internet. I just prefer to troll some Facebook groups and be outside doing my own research. <laughs> or some people who run Facebook groups, you troll them too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I do sell ants on the side, so I, I, I use Formaculture for uh, some care sheets. I've sure. created my own care sheets too, so I've used them as a base. But there's a lot of great information on Formaculture, so I definitely highly recommend checking it out for the beginners. Yeah, and just so you know, guys, um, find a trusted source because, in my experience, ants are just like every other creature that we keep, and everybody who keeps them has a different way of doing it, and whatever mm -hmm. you do is wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> just like fish, dart frogs, uh, isopods, springtails, just like everything. Nor uh, northern blue tongue skinks, crested geckos, everything. Everything you do is wrong, but that guy's good. So um, just be careful. Like like I said in the in the description, everything Scott and I are going to talk about today is is mostly things we either gleaned from the internet or from totally personal experience. So yeah. your mileage may vary. You may have seen something else. We're not here to contradict those people. We're here to just give you our anecdotes, right? And Scott's somewhat expert opinion. I did the thing right. I went the right way um, in my very amateur experience. So, um, but we have news. So now we know where to find out what you have in your area and what to look for and where to get what you find identified. So now what do you do to find the ants when we go to look for them outside we're gonna go catch ants what's your advice to go what's catch my advice and queens and queens i should say <laughs> and queens so know the timing um can't really speak for in the states but different genuses and different species have certain times of day certain uh weather that they'll fly in some species will only fly when it's raining some will fly immediately after a rainstorm some will fly before a rainstorm some will just decide, okay, it's four days before Labor Day. We're just going to explode. <laughs> You're waiting on that right now. Did you say Lacius yeah. Neoniger? Lacius Neoniger, also known as Labor Day ants. They started a couple days ago here. 
and they are only just starting to ramp up. So if you're looking right now for an ant queen, your best bet is to find the Laceous Neo Niger, which I have a couple that I caught the other day in a oh, pod. Nice. I kept them here to do a live uh, live test tubing, as we will nice. call it. So, We're doing that next. So, so yeah, so early in the early summer here so may usually around mother's day we'll see campanotis species flying and they prefer warm evenings so usually by 4 p.m till about 10 or 11 at night because there's still yeah. daylight up here by 11 o'clock so they're they're flying God. in in the warm evenings uh formica kind of fly from early june until september which you'll find them constantly among laceus for whatever reason uh, different species again, different times of the month or different times of the season. Those are the two uh, predominant genera that I have up here. And again, they kind of all have their little niche. So once you figure it out what you're looking for, you'll find out when you're going to, your best times to look. And again, formaculture will be great for that, for your flight times. Then you're going to want to be outside near their desired habitat. So for me, it's open fields in town. You'll find them a lot just along like wooded areas on a sidewalk, walking along the, the, the edges of the sidewalk. Yep. And always carry some sort of device. Like I have deli cups everywhere, stashed in my truck, in my fiance's car, <laughs> in my lunch kit for work. <laughs> in my, my, wife went to, my wife went to drink my bottled water that was in the car for the for the just in case because i'll take a bottle of water with me and then douse right. a cotton ball and put that in the deli cup yeah i uh when i go on road did i do i have it beside me i don't know what i did with it i thought i had it out but i I'm have a uh, major has a shitty computer i'm not frozen for anybody am i i think it's major's issue he's buffering i didn't know buffering was still a thing uh, is that still a thing anyway for some of us folk. But, yeah, so you but get yeah. them in the deli cup. You get them in the little yeah. deli cup. Yeah, so like I was going to look for my little, uh, my my makeup kit. <laughs> but it's actually full of <laughs> <anky pieces. laughs> I have one of those little side satchels. That's my thing. It has a couple of test tubes. It has some cotton balls, a bottle well, of water. I have, main, I have the my main bag, right? So this could count as a satchel in a sense. And then I have it full of all sorts of goodies. But yeah. I, I literally a trowel. Go crazy. Do you have a trowel? Uh, yeah, I have a little mini trowel. Yep. For catching, like sometimes you'll see a colony that you really want. Because um, you can catch yeah. a whole colony sometimes or like the queen and a bunch of her workers and brood. Yeah. Um, I actually have a, a knack for finding small formica colonies, which is nice because I have trouble raising them from single queens. As I'll get into too, that you suddenly right. just have. Uh... Oh, look, she recovered. Huh. I was had an example, but she's actually back with us. But I call it SADS. It's sudden ant death syndrome. That's why I catch ants in the tens to sometimes the hundreds. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. like any common. creature, you don't really know their health, right? Like yep. it's an insect. You can't really give it a clean bill of health like you can some reptiles. But anyway, so I'll catch queens. When you're first out catching, you can keep them together for a couple hours in a single yeah. cup because they're not too territorial till they start getting settled. So I'll, I'll gather a few. Usually it gets pretty tough and to, like to keep them and get them in there without them all running out, as you could imagine, because they can climb the sides. Yeah, they get pretty fast. It's pretty shocking to see how fast they can be. And you just caught them. And you don't want, don't want to freak out. Yeah. So if I'm out just for the day, because I know that they're flying, like Lassius, I don't have to go very far to find them. But some you might have to go out for a couple hours. If you're going to be out all day, make sure that you don't just have cups. Either have a wet cotton ball in there or bring some pre-made test tubes. Yep. That way your ants don't desiccate in your hot vehicle, especially if you're somewhere where it's desert and hot. They will 100% desiccate still. In yeah. the Nevada in the Nevada desert looking for honeypot ants, for example. <laughs> Alex, you want lots of water. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, if you're out, you know, in the desert area, definitely some water. Makes sense. Makes sense. 
Yeah, so like I said, it's pretty easy. Once you've kind of narrowed down the species you're looking for and find out when they're going to fly, you'll just uh, camp out because nine times out of ten, you're going to be unsuccessful. Yeah. I have a hard time. I've been doing this now all professionally for, what, six years now, Josh? I think this is year six. I think Maybe so. This- I haven't known yeah. you for six years, so uh, yeah. I've known you for maybe yeah. four. So but you were doing ants when I met you. You were already, like, hip deep in ants. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You were already doing Tar Heel ants. You were already moved on. You graduated Ants Canada. Um, I remember you sending me pictures of just a drawer of test tubes with ants in them. Um, I still got Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> insane yeah so even with like six years into professional and like hunting kids as a or hunting kids hunting ants as a kid <laughs> hunting kids as an ant, that's, that's another show uh, i'm gonna have you back on how to hunt kids like how to hunt kids you guys don't know <laughs> scott's uh scott's private name is the krampus <laughs> tis the season uh tis but anyway season. so getting back on track <laughs> so you've caught your you've caught your aunt because a lot of people are asking how you get started right so you've caught your yeah. your queen aunt this you want to give her a drink example. because she just had sex for the only time she's gonna and it was so good she's yeah. gonna lay eggs the rest of her life off of that one that one boffing so yeah it, yeah it was done good so good that the males die shortly after it happens yep. every bit of them goes into that female oh, yeah. yep yeah. yep soul deep we call it soul deep intercourse. Soul so, deep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Anyway, so you get them in your deli cup or your little deli cup or your test tube if you came prepared. Or your test tube. Yeah, test tube if you're prepared, then you're already done okay. for the next year. If you've already got them in your test tube. If you've got them in the deli cup, when you get them home, you'll want to, well, before you even go searching, you'll want to get some test tubes. It is the tried and true method. Tried and true method. You could raise them in the deli cup, but that's just mm. causing for more interference, right? And you're disturbing the queen to get to make sure that's mo- the cotton's moist and blah, blah, blah. Your best bet is into the test tube and into a warm, dark area of your house, usually an upper bedroom in a, in a drawer that doesn't often get knocked or used. Just the more they're left alone, the more likely they are to feel relaxed and safe and lay their eggs and raise their brood especially if you get species like formica which are very hyperactive they don't like to be disturbed and when they're stressed out they eat their brood yep they freak is, out yep. yeah yeah they they go crazy and for whatever reason they consume their eggs even their larva so test tube dark warm area of the house undisturbed check on them check on them once a week if you have to especially if the farther south you go, the faster species develop. So check on them once a week just to make sure the test tube hasn't dried out, hasn't gone super moldy. I just cleaned all my test tubes, so I can't really give an example of a moldy test tube that you would want to change. I have a small one here somewhere that is, it actually yeah. dried out and I took it out and it is gross. Oh, it's over on the other desk. Yeah, yeah it was but gross. For most, of, for most of the species of ants that are fully claustral, and you'll tell because they have the bigger, sorry, my camera's not the best quality. Yeah, Let's yeah. see the big golden butt on her. Uh-huh. I mean, she's fully claustral, so she'll stay without food until she's got at least 10 minidics that dig out and hunt in the wild for her. So she can live for a while without food. There's so other hey, species. Time like- out. Time out. We use that word. What's a minidic? Because Kate minidic. needs to know. Kate needs <laughs> to know. Minidic is the first workers that your queen produces. They're smaller than the full-size workers that you would see with the specific species, any species. And that's just because they've been living off of the nutritious juice in your queen's uh, reserves. Muscle stew. Muscle stew. (laughs) Yeah, anything that she was given before she flew and then her body just digests her wing muscles, which obviously she doesn't need anymore once she's found it. And she turns it into soup and then feeds that to the first round of babies who are the nan- nanitics or nanitics or nanitics, yeah yeah it's uh it's actually latin for dipshit they are the <laughs> dumbest ants they are yeah, so they stupid. really no survival skills but oh here's your, here's your whole ants canada setup there your test tube portal. Yeah, i was trying to keep it away out of view but yeah we'll we'll get into that 
But this is the queen that I thought had died. I was going to use her as an example of sads. This is my queen who I thought wasn't going to lay eggs. This is Lila. But you, you can kind of see her right here. Yeah, darn blurry. She's got four pupa right now, so she's a slow starter. See that little cotton, that wad of cotton there? Can you make it out right here? She pulled yep. out a bunch of cotton fibers. I don't know why, but she's uh she's a formica. So like you said, she is um she's a little hyperactive. Yeah, they go yep, spazzy. Yep. I can I'll show you my one of my bigger colonies in a bit too, just to show you how crazy they get. Yep. Them and uh, harvester ants are really hyperactive. Like your Pogonum Remix? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Some of us ladies are just okay. slower than others, Josh. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. It's not you that's that's dumb. It's the ninetics. If it's you ever ninetics. raise ants, you'll see. You'll see. Yeah. We'll, we'll leave that for the group to figure out if they try their own. But anyway, so... Kate, Sandy, I'm saying for real, the first batch... you. Can, Scott, am I making this up? I'm not making a joke. Like they're oh, super no, there's, stupid. There's there's no uh, there's no survival instinct. <laughs> yeah, there's all. none. They are so dumb. And yeah, don't know how to hunt. The queen, yeah. I find, especially in carpentry rants, the queen does a lot of the work, even once the ninetics are there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. they're good at cleaning babies, I, cleaning larvae, yeah. and that's about it. Yeah, that's they're not. About it. They are not good at stuff. Yeah, when they get their first meals, they they just go bananas and they'll run away or let me run show back you in some picks here. All right, I don't know if you guys can see this well. This yeah, so is, those ants. Yeah, these ants here are nanitics in here with uh, yeah, this they're about they're this about half Edna. the size of a full size worker you'll get. Yeah, this is Edna and her three, and you can see she has these are her three nanitics, and she has three more brood. Um, this is also Edna. And Edna, I yeah. just gave them. You want to pause on that? Pause on that picture. So obviously yeah. the brood there; those are those are the pupa. I find a lot, especially on the the other bug groups I'm on. It's just people always just call them eggs, which is fine, but it'll drive us nerds bananas. Yep, <laughs> calling them eggs. So the eggs are actually little white, like little tiny pinhead looking, almost like little tiny grains of rice little white or sometimes off yellow uh, grains that'll hatch into larva. And then you get three or four st stages of larva. And then eventually yep. they'll spin the cocoon. Or sometimes, like, Josh, you have a, a I'm about to show you. Here we species. go. There you go. Sometimes, it's kind of blurry. Hold on. Let me see if I can get a better one. Or I'm lack thereof. We'll just we uh, paint and not have a cocoon. So and these guys... See, like, yeah, you can see they're just out. They're just like curled up somehow. This guy's about to be an ant. This is a the first nanitic. This is going to be number two, but then she's got four more, at least four more, that yeah, are there was uh, actually getting ready. There's a a guy on YouTube. I can't remember his channel, but he actually videoed a leaf cutter ant and at a might have been at a cephalotus, so like a true leaf, like one of the true. Okay fungus growing leaf cutter ants in South America. He filmed the larva transforming into a naked pupa. Like it didn't spin a cocoon. He oh, just wow. had it transforming on the screen. Somehow he caught it perfectly. And you could uh, see the larva like just transform before your eyes. I'm gonna have to get really that cool. link. I wanna see that real bad. I shared it a few years ago on one of the bug groups I'm on. I can see if I can find it and I'll okay. share it on ice. Hey, whatever yeah, you can do. Cool whatever you can do, that would be great. Um, yeah, they're pretty wild. I hadn't I haven't seen any uh in my experience that didn't have the cocoon. Mm -hmm. So I was very confused. I thought the one was just dead. Um, but no, he's turning brown and he's about to he'll probably be stretched out by the end of the show. So hopefully. Yeah, I mean hopefully. So anyway, so you got your queen, you got her in your test tube, you've put her away. Now, again, like I said, depending on species, usually as a beginner, you'll want to start off with the fully claustral. And again, you'll find that out on formiculture once you find yeah. out what what specific species are in your area. I would still recommend, like, sure, you think one's enough, but you're going to want to catch a handful. Nine times out of ten, no matter what you do, the queens will die. And that's just, 
their physiology. They were malnourished. They had some kind of virus, like so many different factors. Um, but you get one queen or two queens to a certain stage where they finally have ninitics. And we can jump to the next thing. Why I like to rep Ants Canada for his test tubes and his equipment, because his test tubes are specially made so they can fit to these adapters. And then from here, you don't even have to go any more than this. Like this right here will cost you about 15 bucks, 20 bucks American because Ants Canada actually is produced and ships out of the United States. Okay. But yeah, so his adapters go into this and I use these as feeding outwards. It's a little messy, but it's just so much easier than trying to feed the ants in the tube. Easier to clean and just full accessible, right? Yep. And you have the little dropper that lid has the little like hole that you can lid. just drop food into. Yep. Yeah. So if they're super hyperactive, you can just drop food down in there. At this stage, mostly they'll stay in their, their test tube portion because that smells like home and it's nice and safe. So yep. this, I love to, I just can't speak to these enough. If you want to go the full visibility route and all the different ports, this allows you to add a new clean test tube. So you don't have to go through the hassle of dumping ants out of here. Once this gets moldy or dries out, you can just put another test tube in the side and they can just move at their pleasure. And they will, they will move. It's a lot yeah. less stressful. Like you can dump them, but I mean, picture that. Picture someone yeah. dumps your whole family into another house. Like, yeah, they just usually it's pretty your house <laughs> and just, dump you into a new house. Yeah, it'll take you a minute to get reorganized. Yeah, not good for their stress, and again, that can hinder the growth of the colony too. Absolutely. Yeah, it so. could injure the queen, injure the workers, injure the the pupa. It's just it's so much easier just to leave them in this, and then easy enough to add tubes if you want to expand them from here on out rather than forcing them. A lot of people just say dump because it's quick and easy, but definitely stresses out the colony. Yeah. Sandy says they're for sure the boss of her yard. Um, Kate, how boss long does it take them to go from ants from eggs to adults? It does vary kind of a lot between species. It varies. Uh, sometimes I get anomalies. So most of the species, up in Canada require diapause, so hibernation for two to three months. So <clears throat> stick them in the fridge, keep them cool. And then once something with their physio physiology, physiology, once they're out and start to warm up again, then their body starts working and they start producing eggs. Sometimes I've been surprised where queens have just kept in, in the drawers will actually have one or two ninitics when the rest don't even have eggs yet. So haven't quite figured that out. So must have just been super fed before she uh, was captured. And it's yeah, but life. typically once either in the States, like Josh, where he's caught his just a month ago and they already have workers. They can Probably be closer that to fast. six weeks, closer to six, six weeks, weeks, probably maybe a little more. But yeah, yeah I went from a so, queen to I have three queens that I caught and I have mm -hmm. uh, from eggs to workers in, in yeah. six weeks, which is actually yeah, faster so than everybody assumed. So, mm -hmm. yeah, everybody thought it would be like two months or something. Um, and I don't have them on heat. I just have them on my desk. So they're at like probably 70 degrees. Yeah. So that's like my, my basement here. So I've got, so the larger the ants also, the longer they'll take to develop, obviously. So your small yeah. little tropical ants, your little um, uh, Tapanoma still. What else? You got pavement ants, which our... Uh, I always blank out on that names when I'm talking. They're yeah, there yeah. every but as soon as I'm on live, I forget their names. But anyway, they'll come to me. Tetramorium. They uh yeah, they grow Tetramorium. Really the pavement ants. But like carpenter ants, like she has she has a clutch of eggs. I caught her uh late May. So they won't develop more <laughs> until they go through hibernation. <clears throat> but for your smallest ants, you're looking at about one month from egg to worker. For anything larger it depends on the heat so the warmer you keep them the more you feed them once there's workers and more larvae the quicker they'll grow as well so you're looking one to three months before you have workers depending on species yeah which isn't uh too crazy especially if you're living in a southern state or somewhere a little warmer where they're used to it so like um what are you doing i'm gonna take a break and put bingo away because she might be getting a little stress. <laughs> we 
Bridget really wants to play. Yeah, I think I'm going to put Bingo away. Keep talking about ants. Um, the next stage. So you have your your uh, test tube portal from AC. Yeah, test tube portal. So this, you can honestly keep a call right in back. here. Well, I could keep a call in here for a few years. Just depending, again, on the growth of the colony. Some zip on how you feed them grow faster than not. So you can keep them in here nice and easy on the space. I will start repping uh, Tar Heel Lance, which is all we see behind me, but they vary in size. So your next size up would be something more like this for a nest. Again, I, I have Tetramorium in here, but they've blocked themselves off in there. Uh, but you got to keep in mind, ants like to be cramped. So you might think that they're overcrowding because they're piling on top of each other and taking up all the walls. They, they like to be cramped. They feel more secure and safe and tight quarters. They're definitely not uh, introverted. <laughs> so no. they can, they, a lot of people keep uh, even up to like a hundred or so ants in the single test tube before they even give it a world. I honestly don't know how they how they feed their colonies that way because even with a handful of netedicks, just because they storm and seem to fly out as soon as you open the or pull the cotton out. Yep. I, I that's why I like the portals. But again, you just add more test tubes if your ants are taking up all the space in the in the test tube. And yeah, really the. Uh, what am I trying to say here? The choice is yours, really, to when you move them into a bigger nest. But like I said, larger isn't necessarily bigger. Like Ants Canada, you'll see all his hybrid nests and everything. They're meant for colonies that already have like a thousand plus workers. Like they're they're bloody yeah. massive. Yeah. That's why I like that's why I like Tar Heel ants so much. Like this will last you like two or three years, depending again on the size of the colony or the, Not me. Not me. the size of the ant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not Sheila. Sheila gets a freaking room to herself. But again, tropical, not necessarily a native species to uh, Illinois. They are native. Uh, I have them in my yard, actually. Yep. Okay. I have Gambino's discount. This queen was not native. She's from New That's Jersey. That's what I mean. But she's yeah, still she not tropical. She's from New Jersey. So yeah. kind of along the same meridian. But, um, yeah. or is it longitude? But they no, don't require hibernation. Area. So she's just as long as you feed her, she's just producing and producing, right? So I feed her and I keep heat on this little bitty section here. Yeah, this is the only spot with heat, and the only thing she puts there is uh, pupa. The larvae aren't there, the eggs aren't there, the eggs are all yeah. over on the other side where it's like a little bit less warm. Yeah, that's actually something important to to mention that you'll want a heat gradient once you start getting in some more space. So if you yep. say you expanded this, so you want one side to be warmer, one side to be cooler, so they can self-regulate. It's a little Don't bit Don't put heat on the water. Don't put heat on the water of the tube. Don't put heat on the water. Yeah, it'll yeah. it'll leach out and it'll drown your ants. Yeah, when you have them in the test tube and anything small like that, no direct heat, just ambient air temperature is fine. Once you get into the larger nest, you can put your heat I use heat cables, so one side, usually away from yeah. any kind of power source. So one side is hot and dry, and the other side can be cooler. And, and then, then the, you want the a moisture the gradient, too. You want to have yeah. some kind of moisture gradient, too, once they get in a bigger setup. Yeah. Then they'll figure out where yeah. the babies go. <laughs> and that's what I like, especially once you have larger colonies, the bigger areas, so the different levels. Yeah. The water, the... Humidity chambers are all on the bottom, so the ants, the higher up they go, the drier they get, which is kind of like real life, right? Yeah. So the deeper you go, the more there's still moisture. So they'll tend to keep the eggs and the larvae closer to the water sources, and like you're seeing with Sheila, the mm. the pupa get moved up to where it's dry and warm. And yeah, mostly the warmth is what they're going for. Yeah, yeah. It depends yeah. on how developed the pupa is. So um, I notice when they're ready to hatch, they bring them down to where it's closer to the water because in, in this tank there's yeah. still water here the bottom inch and a half or so there's yeah. still water um basically which is water so uh that moisture comes up so she will have there's pupa here you can even see them right there see that white that's pupa barely and they go yeah. all the way up so but these are probably about to close e-close is when they hatch so 
I have the big brain ant words. I don't have all the Latin names, but I have the big brain Latin or not Latin, but the, the big brain ant words. Yeah. But moisture is super important just because of how fast the ants will actually desiccate, dry out. So fast. So fast. Like over not even overnight, within a couple hours you could lose a yeah. colony if your if your water sources dry out. They're so they're even they're way more sensitive even than isopods. So mm -hmm. yeah, make yeah. sure you're not very them. forgiving. Especially your laceous. Uh, I find actually formica like a drier environment, but you still got to have access to fresh water, even if they've sure. got zero humidity. As long as there's water, they'll be fine. But laceous don't matter. I've lost a couple colonies, unfortunately, because their water source dried out. I didn't realize it. And overnight, they were fine that night. I thought they had water, but they didn't. The next morning when I check them, they're all dead. Wow. Wow. See that, guys? That's all. They, they can't even go like us a couple days. But I guess they're tiny, so maybe that's it. Super tiny, yeah. But, it's yeah, I think it's weird how quick and how sensitive they are because you see them outside or whatever. They're in, like, sand. They're in dry dirt. And you're just like, well, how would they just dry out? But it's not dry underground. That's the yeah, truth. there's still a little bit of humidity that they can cling on to, or moisture, yep. I guess, that keeps them yep. going, which is lacking in a... a artificial environment yeah plastic yeah. tubes a little plastic dumb plastic tubes. setup yeah. you know um that was a problem yeah. i had with my original setup with sheila actually i had a 3d printed um it's basically like a slab formicarium right where you're just looking down at them and right. um underneath it had a tray so it has a tray and then the formicarium goes on top of it and there's like a maybe a third of an inch in between or mm -hmm. five millimeters uh, <laughs> and you put the, you put like a sponge underneath and then fill that with water. There was a separate area to be able to fill it. And then there are things right on top. So the moisture would come up through this uh, screen area. And if that dried out, like, cause you can't see it. So if that yeah. dried out, that could have been bad, but they had test tubes attached too. So it was kind of, they had that a backup, helps. but it never got to that point. Cause I was, I was pretty insane about Sheila making her grow and it shows how nurtured she was. Yeah, like my like how how long have you had Sheila? I don't even think it's been three years. I have my book somewhere, but it might have been three years now. Um, yeah. I'll check my logs because I have when I first got her, I started a book, and I got about four pages into the notebook, and then just totally stopped. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Again, so I had five. I had five colonies, and she was the only one that made it. And so then I had my winter ants that got murdered or escaped or they might still be here. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I can't seem to keep them alive. So I don't know if they'd survive in a basement. Yeah. I don't know. They might. I have a fridge. Um, they, I had those, they, they're gone. Um, I had another form of a queen in my trick and mermix. It's kind of depressing when you have a colony and it just goes and it, you kind of know it's your fault. Sometimes it's not. So, yeah, catch as many queens as you can, kind of, because you're going to lose half, at least. You're probably going to lose half. You're going to lose half, especially if you're starting right from a single queen in the founding yeah. stage. That's the hardest. The hardest part is getting past the first couple of years with your colony. Even if they've gotten to the point where they've got 10, 20, 30 workers, yeah. you could still have a crash. Um, how long will Sheila live? Sheila, by my research, she could live like another 20 years, maybe. Yeah, usually like so. queen ants have been observed to live 20, 30 years. Yeah. As well, as long as they're kept in optimal conditions, well fed, well maintained, they don't get a weird disease or might break out or anything like that. Yeah. Gotcha. In, perfect, in a perfect world, 30, 30 years upwards. Later, major. For most thing. species, yeah. Um, there's a few, a lot of the polygynous colonies with, or species, which are, with polygynous meaning they can have multiple queens. Uh, the queens usually have a shorter lifespan, but it's because they're just those ones tend to like overproduce eggs, and they're just laying eggs constantly, and they yep. wear themselves yep. up. And it's that a, would almost be yeah. a blessing. Like I, like I have to manage her, uh, her population now by managing like protein intake. <clears throat> and so when I manage it, she gets pretty feisty. So that's when she starts really digging to get out, trying to get away. Um, and looking for ways out. Like right now she's really chill because I've hit this balance because I, I called, I had to call some of her population. Um, I would say like 2,000 ants 
Uh, wow. Got vacuumed. It's, yeah. That's that's crazy because you've had Sheila three years. I'll say three years. I think it's roughly three years. Three years, and that you started with just a handful, like not even a hundred workers, right? She was twenty. I think she had about twenty workers yeah. when I got her. Yeah. Okay. So in, in comparison, so that's that's a colony that doesn't hibernate, is always kept on heat, constantly yep. fed proteins and sugars like every day, nonstop, almost. Whereas my colony in this setup here, Carpenter yep. colony, Campanotus vicinus, requires hibernation. Usually they're any time now, actually. They've actually started slowing down. I I used to have them hooked up to this outworld for foraging, okay. where they're active all day, every day, all night, all day, collecting. I would be feeding them 10, 20 cockroaches, crickets every day. Now they're not even out collecting sugar water. They're ready for hibernation, and it's just it's august <laughs> it's, it's august <laughs> and they're ready for hibernation and their their temperature they're at 25 degrees right now celsius in in that enclosure there or the setup Unreal. so at 25 celsius they're already in pre-hibernation that is unreal. so the larvae like uh, the, they're not taking in protein anymore so i'll drop food in there just to see and they won't even touch it the larvae have already stopped growing and this colony is five or six years old now and i probably only just hit maybe a thousand workers in the span that josh has seen like twenty thousand, thirty thousand workers no so again, I, I think she was close to 10. I think the estimates that you and josh kristinak gave me and um cheeto lord that I've, i don't know cheeto's real name uh cheeto who's been on the show you guys are like my aunt experts and they say probably around 10 looking at it but i, I think it might have been more because even when I gave her the hundred gallon, she carpeted every square inch of this tank. Yeah, you've got in there. I'm not going to exaggerate as much as Mikey from Ants Canada does when he has a colony for million. three weeks. And he's got two million. Yeah, within three weeks. Yeah, that's a bit of an overstatement, but I wouldn't. I would say yours is upwards in like the ten thousand range for sure. I'll see that maybe in five more years with this colony to those numbers. But again, they don't tend to get as large up here in Canada as they do in the States for colony sizes, minus your, your formica and your lacia. So the smaller the ant, the yeah. larger the colony you'll see. Well, and you can see, like you were talking about how they like it cramped. Like, so that little yeah. pointing at your screen, um, that little over your left shoulder, it, it's small. Just a little thing? I mean, it looks big. It, it's big once it's in your hand. It's a small container. That's less than a shoe box. Okay? No, the, like the other one, the one that your ants are actually in, the diaplause ants. This one. Yeah. I mean, that's a good size for a macarium, but it's smaller than a shoebox. Yeah. And there's 2,000 ants in there. Uh, no, not even. But okay. there could be. So, like, one side is still empty. But they're all, see how they've all crammed. Yeah. Kind of into it. Where is my screen? There we go. And so they all, they'll do that. There. Even Sheila does that. Like, she feels so comfortable when there's just, there's millions. Yeah. Oh, hey, Tennyson. Who was talking about getting ants and I thought they'd be here. So yeah, don't worry about space. Oh, Your ants will be fine in nice cramped quarters. So really it's not too uh, expensive of a hobby. I do recommend going for the professional enclosures, the tried and trues. Yeah. Spend the money. If you're serious about getting into the hobby, spend the money, do the, do your research. Don't just buy the $5 enclosures off of Amazon or uh, what's that new thing? Timu? T no. Yeah, Timu. Timu. Yeah, Timu, Timu has one. Don't Timu don't order has. off Timu and Wish or anything like that because it's just junk and you will get what you pay for. And or Uncle Milton's or whatever is Uncle Milton's right? The old shitty one. Yeah, they're you know they're kind of cool to witness uh, like ants digging, but I wouldn't you wouldn't be able to raise a colony in those either, just because no. you can't the humidity without the colony collapsing. If you want to see them do their burrowing for the isopod people, your substrate would be perfect. Like I have zebras over in that corner that if they collapse in that uh, critter carrier, so don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't been able to upgrade them yet to a proper, uh, just a tub setup like my roaches are in below. Yeah. But that critter keeper would be uh, perfect to uh, attach a test tube or uh, a tubing system to, to your ant colony to watch them dig and do their normal thing. You can just cover up the I have the ideas. Vent. I have ideas yeah. and you want to see, uh, I always have ideas. I haven't made them work yet, but um, I haven't tried. 
So I'm going to come up with something that you can do at home that's an easy DIY that you can watch them dig all day and not have to worry too much about their uh, their situation as far as humidity is. I was yeah, just talking to somebody who's going to, they're going to homestead, Josh Kristinet, the, the guy that's going to be a myrmecologist. Him and his lady are going to uh, buy some land and homestead. And I said, he's a huge ant guy. So I was like, right away, right away, this is how my brain works. This was today. So within 10 seconds, I'm texting him. You have to dig a trench and line one of the walls or both of the walls with glass and then promote ant queens digging right next to the glass and then just keep it covered and, you know, offer them food and, and water and whatever from the top and just be able to watch that ant colony grow down the side of the glass. It'd be pretty slick if he could uh, do that for honeypot ants. Oh, even. yeah. Well, he wants to do a whole building of Ada, like dedicate a building to Ada. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're in Arizona. He's in Arizona. So he has Ada. Yeah. 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 And honeypots. So that's, that's living the dream. Those are the two like cherry species. Those guys, silver ants would be really cool. Uh, <clears throat> uh They're out of Africa. Oh, out of Africa. Yeah, they're like literally silver to reflect the sun because they live in such hot areas that they're like the fastest ant in the world. Oh, those guys. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Can't give you the name, yeah. but I know what you're talking about. Cool. So what have we covered? Have we covered what we're looking for here i'm kind of off we covered, track. we're back up to the bigger setups um you can also diy once you get a little bit into it or you're an idiot and think you know everything you can diy a setup i've had catastrophes with this this colony um she escaped when she had like 300 workers i went down There's to check on her and there was one ant <laughs> there was one ant in the setup like guys guys what the hell and so yeah. I tore my house apart looking for that because I'm like, that's a mature, that's a viable ant colony loose in my house. And everyone will tell you, like Campanotis is the, the uh, carpenter ant. They will tell you that Campanotis will just eat your house like a termite. That is not true. No. They chew through rotten wood. So at, if anything, they let you know you have a problem in your foundation. So in the wood in your house. They'll definitely make the problem worse, but they won't start the problem. <laughs> That's for sure. Right. So, but yeah. it would be a great indicator. Like if you have Campanotis ants in your house, you have rotten wood in your house. So yeah. maybe get that checked out. Find out where they're coming from, roughly, and uh, get that checked out. So I had a Campanotis pensilinicus coming in from outside, and I thought they were in my wall, and I got real worried behind the fridge. So I was like, I drilled holes in the wall. I was like looking in there. I have one of those cameras that you can put in your toilet and go up the toilet is on the snake thing. Um, and I couldn't find any evidence that there was a nest in the walls. So that was good. But so, yeah, there's some like half inch holes behind my fridge in the wall itself. Because, you know, Crazy. yeah, well, I mean, what's the worst that could happen? You have to fix your drywall. If that's the worst that has happens there. Amen. Keep it. That's beautiful. So cool. Uh, but yeah, so they're an indicator, but there's so many catastrophes that could happen. Like they, so she got loose. She was in a house plant. So if you have a colony that's open, my advice that no one brings up, or maybe they don't know, keep a house plant right next to it. So if you have an escape, that's where they'll go. So they'll you see this, uh, maybe you can see it. See that Jade plant there. That's right next to Sheila's 30 gallon. And Every time she's tried to escape or had a minor escape, that thing's been bustling with ants. They immediately go there and start throwing all the dirt on the floor. <laughs> yeah, contrary to belief, they do prefer nesting in soil. Yep. 90% of the time. Yeah. They'll take Absolutely. the soil over wood. Yeah. It's just more ideal for them. Uh, we didn't really touch on what to feed the ants. So again, first starting off for the claustrals, you don't need to feed them anything. I've, done the experiment where I've fed queens nothing. I've fed queens a mix of honey or sugar water, and some I've given even proteins like little fruit flies. And honestly, I haven't seen any benefit from it. Yeah, sure, you might think you're doing them a favor, but really, they're already ready to not eat for a few months. Yeah. So they're good. De definitely, though, once they start laying 
well, not even once they start laying eggs, once you have your first nanitics appear, you'll want to feed them more so for the uh, the nanitics themselves because they need the the carbs. They don't need the protein. Workers will just live off carb carbs, and it's the queen and the larva that need the protein. So yep. if you have yep. once you have actual workers, then you start feeding protein. Just the queen itself, you really only need to give her carbs. So sugar, uh, some formica. Um, see, it's gone again. The, the pavement ants. <laughs> they'll, they'll Tetramorium. Tetramorium. Thank you. You're Jeez. welcome. I only remembered it because you said it earlier, and I was like, oh, right, Tetramorium. Yeah, yeah a lot of the ants will process seeds. Some like Proganomarium. Pug on mix, harvester ants will just eat seeds. They will take some insect proteins, but they'll mostly live off seeds. They mostly just so, yeah. murder the insects because they're violent. They are, <laughs> they oh, are yeah, they're bad. So uh, they are the only legal ant in the United States to uh, transport across state lines. So if you don't want to wait to uh, raise a queen or a colony from a single queen. Not uh, true anymore. Not true. Did that change? Yep, we can ship. Uh, there's like 20 them. species now. Discolor, Campanotus okay. Discolor, Pennsylvanicus. Campanotus Pennsylvanicus is a great starter ant, I think, because they're huge and they're yeah. really easy to watch. Like, they're fun to watch because they're monsters. Um, now, this, the Formica, Edna, and uh, Lila and Mar Madge are all like, I would say, a medium yeah. ant. But I think Amp Keepers would still say she's Formica. So I th still think they would think it's kind of large. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm not too worried about escapes. But Pogonomermics are really cool because they don't climb glass. So if you keep yeah. your glass clean, they're super easy to keep in an open setup because you don't need the, um, uh, oh, you can't see it, but you can, you don't need the powder. You don't need that Teflon crap that's on there. Um, you don't need any of that stuff. You just need clean glass and you're good to go. Yeah, so, the, so there are a few more ants legal to ship across state lines. So that's good to know. In Canada, as long as they're found already within canada you can ship them wherever so i can order amps in ontario and he, he's one of the guys that i'm I actually kind of partially work with kind of partnered with he uh, owns canada ant colony his name's zach okay. Okay. he ships ants across canada he actually has started importing ants as well so anything that could be found in a greenhouse he can almost immediately get permits to import them and then distribute them throughout canada so he's oh, kind wow. of pioneering, oh, wow. he's pioneering the ant keeping hobby here more so than even Ants Canada has done. So I've been working with him. I actually I'm 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 babysitting a shit ton of or part of my language, but a uh, shit part ton of, of language. Of language. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I've said it like nine <laughs> times already this episode. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I'm babysitting a bunch of his colonies because I've actually done a couple of the reptile shows here in Edmonton. Yeah, to actually uh, spread the word for ant keeping. How's that working out? How are they doing at shows? You probably get a lot of like looky loos, but is it? Yeah, we, it, we actually sold a lot. It's uh, a lot of people are actually interested into it, especially once they see how easy it can be and not too harsh on the wallet. A lot of it was just informational, and we gave out a lot of them. Like, we just talked a okay. lot and about his cards, and I talked about my our group and my the page i have this finan keeping but a lot of it was just educational but a lot of people have messaged seeing if we're going to be here there in the fall so for anybody in alberta on the show tonight or who watches us later we will be at the next reptile show in edmonton on september 30th and october 1st and we can just chat ants all day there too but yeah. we'll have some of uh, zach from canada ant colonies ants for sale and excitingly enough, he's going to have some trop more tropical species. So he's got some Fedoli. He finally got. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping maybe he'll subsidize. So I'll have a, a colony that doesn't require hibernation. Oh, That's you're going to be living the dream. Yeah. How big are Fedoli? Because I don't, I don't have access oh, to them here. They are tiny. So the queen, I believe, is no bigger than a Tetramorium queen. Okay. They're so like five millimeters, maybe? maybe. Yeah, Fadoli are big-headed ants. Ants Canada has featured them a few times, and with his 4K videos, they look massive. Yeah, but yeah, I believe yeah. yeah, the queens are only about a centimeter in size. Their majors, like the big-headed ones, are yeah. probably half yeah. a centimeter. 
and their smallest workers are within like two, I would say two or three millimeters in size. So they're really small ants, but they grow to the thousands within a few months, like colony size, right? Wow. Yeah. And I consider them one organism. So I treat them like one organism. Like Sheila is the are. queen's name. Sheila is the colony. This Sheila yeah. is the colony. So, yeah. and then like Madge and Edna and Lila are going to be the same way. And Doris. Yeah, well, once you get to a certain size, you don't even see the queen anymore, right? And it's just all you I see. I haven't her seen her. No, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to find your queen in that thing. And it's all open in your target yep. lands. Last time, they, they move around all the time, too. So, last time she was up in here in a mass. Okay. So, there's a big larva mass there. And then in behind, somewhere in all the bodies, is the queen. But yeah, yeah they keep just... pretty well like swarmed. So, yeah. it's hard. I, I've seen, I thought I saw Sheila, the queen one time in the last three, last like two years since she moved into the 30 i think i've seen her once um i confident she's still in the 30 because that's where all the eggs and larvae are so i'm like 99 percent sure but i don't know so the other setup is too open like it's not i don't think it's comfortable enough for her and it's chaotic there <laughs> all right so uh back to feeding so we've already covered like you don't need to feed your colossal queens i do have uh, a semi colossal for your myrmicas i believe even tetramorium or semi claustral so she's really really small and there's a oh, dead wow. serenac roach but she is that little black dot right there okay and that's a yeah. roach nymph so i put that yeah. in there because semi claustrals do need to be fed because their gasters are so small, they can't. They don't have a social stomach. They don't store food. They literally need to feed every other day. So her, I'll be dropping in. I ran out of fruit flies, so I've just been using cockroach nibs. But you'll feed your uh, semi claustrals every other day. Otherwise, are you doing like pre crushed? Well. You're doing pre crushed, right? They're not. Oh yeah, for for individual queens, pre crushed. Yeah. Even for uh, my larger ants, especially cockroaches, because they're so fast, they tend to just run. I know Sheila can take them down, but. For mine right now in their sizes i, I pre-crush if it's i do pre crush a, too just because it's like there's too many places they would go and i want to see it you know what i mean? I want to see the feeding behavior mm -hmm. so if you have fruit flies fruit flies are my number one food like i raised that colony <laughs> exploded two years ago <laughs> if you want to laugh <laughs> if you want to laugh and you get into ants get your colony up to like whatever it is the first round in anitics you'll have like six to ten give them one fruit fly in the test tube <laughs> and just cancel whatever yeah. you're doing for like an hour and just sit and stare at them. You will laugh hysterically. It's like watching a Benny Hill episode because they mm -hmm. think they have it and like the flightless fruit flies can kind of jump. So it'll get out of their way and they'll be like, where did it go? <laughs> it's the best thing ever. And they're all agitated. They know it's there and the yeah. queen won't do anything to catch it is the best part. Yeah. My, my favorite for watching it hunt is actually Lacius. They're, they're small and you think they're unassuming hunters, but they are crazy predators. If I find any in the next few days, I'll post on the ISO Buddies Facebook group. Okay. Uh, little house centipedes. I'll feed them to my larger Lacius colony and they are savages. Like they take down like the big ones. I'm not talking the little stringy yellow ones. I'm talking like the... The hairy leg ones? Yeah. I don't know their wow. scientific name to let people know, but I don't like either. The, the ones that are fast as hell and they have the hairs yeah. for legs. Yeah. No, those yeah. are house and no, not them. Not those ones. Okay. These ones are menacing. They look like your larger ones, but they're about an eighth of the size. But I'll okay. I'll get it on there. They'll take those guys down. Like they're crazy wow. at how good at hunting they are. Even better than Formica, which are like insect assassins almost. Yeah. So yeah, for, for food, I definitely uh, recommend fruit flies for your base protein, especially when the colony is at smaller size. Yep. Uh, you always want to have a constant supply of sugar. So what I do with these guys, I don't have it here, but I'll you typically attach a honey water test tube. So I'll set it up the same way with more than half of honey water blocked with a cotton swab or yeah, cotton swab and hook it up. That way they can just get it whenever. It's a cotton ball, guys, in America. It's a cotton ball. Cotton ball, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, cotton swab is technically a Q-tip. So a cotton ball here, That's too. a cotton swab. That's, there you go. Yeah, that's a cotton swab. Sorry. That's okay. I'm just, just 
having issues talking as normal. when you said when you said larger doesn't always mean bigger i i yeah. almost peed my pants like i let it go because I, I know you're nervous <laughs> and it's, it's not not even that i'm nervous i don't know what it is i just i just can't talk for long periods of time apparently <laughs> larger doesn't yeah. always mean bigger yeah yes it does larger doesn't always yes, it does, yeah. yes it does i don't even know i said that that's right nope so i just let it go <laughs> until now <laughs> Oh jeez! I'm not a great friend. Up. I'm just a friend. Um, what yeah, were you saying? So you're saying sugar? Oh, go ahead. Sugar all the time. Typically, just I don't always have the time to maintain the honey water tubes because it does okay. go off sooner. I'll put in like sliced apples. Usually, any kind of organic fruit is good for the sugar as well. Just yep. cut small enough that you're not getting into mold problems, and big enough that they can't carry it back into the test tube because again, you'll run into mold problems. So they have to forage from outside. Uh, yeah, sugar all the time, protein at a smaller stage every few days. As the colony grows, obviously they'll become more hungry. You got more larva, more the queen's producing more eggs. You want to increase the uh, the protein intake, and that also dictates how fast the colony grows, right? So if you want the colony yeah. to grow faster, more protein. If you want to slow down the growth, less protein. You kind of just get a feel for how your specific colony will do because every colony i find is different even within the same species so some will some will be more protein hungry than others and some will be more sugar hungry so you just kind of got to feel out your colony and again research your species for their specific diet needs which can be found on at wiki and also on formaculture yeah .com. yeah and any of the groups like if you're on iso buddies you can just post your question on there and i'll try to answer or yeah, any of the other will. Or I'll yeah. direct it to somebody and get back to you. <laughs> Give them diabetes? No, because I don't believe they have uh, the same organs as uh, mammals have. <laughs> diabetes. My head colony's yeah. got the bitus. <laughs> um, how do they do with high fructose corn syrup? I, fine. I mean, high fructose corn fine. syrup yeah. sugar. It's just yeah, sugar. I, I tend to go, go the more natural route, but people... People love to experiment with the sugars. Like you see them in in the wild, you spill a can of soda, and they'll be all over it, right? So, yeah. This is uh, I will say I tried a cap full of Sprecher's original, best soda money can buy. Um, I hope they're listening. God, I hope they listen and they they sponsor me. I don't even want money. I just want a lifetime supply of Sprecher's. Um, but yeah, she went crazy for a cap full. You know the the cap yeah. of the bottle full yeah, uh, yeah that's like half an hour and it was gone she went nuts yeah. so that and um i used the raw sugar i mm -hmm. use the grain the big grains of the raw sugar and then um sometimes i'll do white sugar but it but that's in a like a bowl situation that's not in a test tube i would right. do just white sugar in a test tube yeah yeah what's your ratio yeah. what's your ratio because you don't want it to be like a syrup no, you still want it to be quite fluid. Hey, I sure. I don't really measure it out. I just kind of go by sight. So I'll sure. get hot water and I'll put it in a cup and then I'll just start. I tend to go for the a honey and maple syrup mix because, you know, maple syrup is in abundance here. I'll blend it together and then just as long as it's dissolving so you don't see the, the honey granules anymore in there and then yeah. I'll know when it starts, I'll, that's where you stop basically and then same thing with sugar just keep adding sugar till it doesn't dissolve anymore and then you know that you're at your concentration okay do you use a bee yeah, pollen I like, uh no uh, i've tried giving them bee pollen but i haven't really seen any from any of the species i keep they, they kind of ignore it okay yeah, yeah i've heard that you, too but i've heard people swear by it and i'm like i don't know what you're keeping because none of my colonies have ever given a damn about it so, no, I've never seen it. Maybe once the colonies get a bit larger, or maybe you could uh, dilute it in some water. I yeah, think maybe. it would break apart, right? It starts they to might. smell. It starts yeah. to get like crappy real quick. So, yeah. So I, I have bee pollen, but I, I feed it more so to the isopods and yeah, some of my yeah. other creatures. But yeah, you guys so that'll eat anything. <clears throat> yeah, constant source of sugar. Um, the thing I've seen come around a lot and it's a lot it's really popular is uh biformica's ant nectar yeah I, I think it's sunburst sunburst nectar sunburst is, yeah sunburst. Uh, i've never tried it myself it's pricey. yeah it's 
pricey. So I just I just go with honey, sugar, water, and the ants do just fine off that. And then, of course the the fruits. I try to keep it more natural than giving them just artificial sugars, just because you know like just like any other creature, you want to give them the best diet for their ultimate health, right? Yep. So who knows Absolutely. what junk, junk we've put into our sugars, our candies. Ugh. Yeah, it's to enjoy. not good. No. No, so keep it natural as best you can. And, yeah, for proteins, like I said, fruit flies are the best. But really, most, in my experience, they'll eat anything, any insect protein you give them. Some people give egg, raw chicken, raw fish. It all depends on how much you want how messy you want to get to like in Josh in your setup yeah. feeding the raw chickens and stuff would be a little bit better. Cause you could have more bioactive enclosure, but in like a small setup like this, I don't think you'd really be wanting to put any kind of raw meat and just no. cause it, no. it's, raw it's going to get real gross real fast. Yeah. Just, I just stick to insect proteins for the most part. I haven't even tried for my bigger colony giving raw meat. I have the, insect, um, uh, the refrigerated dog food. Now for um, for bingo, and so I gave a little kernel of that. I've, I've been giving her uh, nuggets of it, like it's little nuggets, like little bits like this, kibble shaped and sized. Um, so Sheila has gotten it, and um, they do go for human blood, Jedi. They do. Um, <laughs> they spray it with formic acid first, but they go right at it. Um, so yeah, so Sheila's eating it. I gave these guys a nugget, the little colonies with an anidics. I gave them each a little tiny little piece today, right before the show. So I'm going to see if they go for it. One of them already had it in its mouth before we started. There you go. So, I can't say I, had had success with, I haven't had success with cat food either. I've, I have multiple cats. Yeah. I've tried their dry food and I've tried their wet food. And again, no, no real response. Yeah. We well, don't have a setup big enough. So with Sheila, um, I think this might've been a boost for her as I got the wet food, feed it to my cat, whatever is left in the can. I would just literally put the can in her cage in uh, and Sheila's tank cool. and it would be swarmed. You couldn't nice. even see cat food after about a half an hour. So, cause it would just be ants. Yeah. So for the, for the larger, more voracious colonies, they'll definitely have a wider appetite for sure. Yeah. I mean, I think it just is like the size of your setup is, is a thing, yeah. but that could be too. It's going to dry out real fast. The cat food, the wet cat mm -hmm. food. I've never seen them go after anything dry. My girl's like, I've given her freeze-dried stuff. She doesn't care. Um, freeze-dried gamma shrimp. She's, they steal them from the fish. So I'll sprinkle fish food out on the, you know, on the water, and they're mm -hmm. all over the water. Uh, the, they, every chance they get to contact the water, they're there, and they'll smell it or whatever, and they'll pick it out of the water and then take it back to the nest. <laughs> nice. Yeah, once it's hydrated. Yeah. <laughs> yep. It's wild. Um but that's a totally different situation. Like yours, I admire the setups that are like this. I'm going to do more controllable setups for my future mm -hmm. colonies. So. Like I, said, I swear by them just because they're, they're so low maintenance, right? You don't yeah. have to worry as much about creating your own moisture or heat gradients. They they come pre-made. Pre like the, each one has little water towels, towers in the bottom. You fill them up, that's your humidity. And then the little tubes uh, sticking out of the sides use them yep. for water for hydration one has sugar water one has regular water the one on the lower bottom is actually just for ventilation okay that's uh, good especially with like a formica because they i know that they do like death spray sometimes oh yeah if they get too agitated that's another thing you got to worry about and if you do have an, a colony that does use formic acid as in a as a defense mechanism such as formica ants as is in their name they can go crazy they'll start spraying their acid and they'll actually uh kill themselves with their formic acid i've had that happen to yeah. a couple colonies in test tubes where i've bumped the test tube just ever too much and they just go nuts and within minutes the colony is done yeah they basically so, so it on it, burn themselves yeah it's bad it's yeah. bad just like anything alive ventilation is key Again, some species like poor ventilation, where Lacius do really well in uh, in those uh, congested, stagnant air spaces because it holds moisture better. Okay. Where others like Formica need that ventilation because of their 
potential uh, self-destructive. <laughs> there is suicidal acid. tendencies. <laughs> yeah. um, how how do you do you do anything else with cleanup crews? I'd be loath to put isopods in one of those setups where they could get back in the nest. I've tried isopods when I did a, a little bit of. A bioactive enclosure. I tried it with the, them with the lacia. So I kind of similar to. Sorry, there's a cat here. Uh, so in this one specifically here, used to be an outworld for my lacia ants. Okay. And I had I, I had just my local um, porcel. I think they're porcelio. I suppose that I find okay. in my backyard right here. I had a whole bunch of them in with the lacia ants, and they just hunted them. So it, really anything large enough for the ants to hunt, they'll probably take them down. I do see in the wild the micro, like microfauna. So little, okay. those little millipedes, little white, I don't know what they are. They're slightly longer and a little bit bigger than springtails that okay. live in the soil with them. So you could try to play around with stuff like that. But anything larger, like isopods, maybe dwarf whites would be okay, but I've never really tried anything. Uh, I do have, there are springtails in with the larger Campanotus because it does maintain yeah. enough humidity. So the springtails are in there. They leave them alone. It's really good because they like to stockpile their insect corse, corpses and their own corpses on the other side of the chambers where you can't see. So feel free yeah. to play around. I wouldn't use anything expensive <laughs> as a cleanup crew. <laughs> I would start with your cheap ones, but I find yeah. that they tend to hunt down your isopods and anything larger than a springtail tends just to get eaten. Yeah, they um my isopods eventually got eaten by the ants when I, I cut them back on protein to slow them down. And so they just mm -hmm. murdered every isopod within like a week. None of the isopods were there anymore. Um, and I used, I had a big ton of them. So I used Punta Canas and they looked really oh, yeah. cool in there. Um, yeah but they're, they're not there anymore. Um, but springtails initially when I, when she was in that flat formicarium thing with the tubes, um, I had the most hillbilly set up. I'm going to do it again for one of these guys because it was so fun. Um, but it was like a little kid's setup and it looked like a science experiment and she loved it. Sheila loved it. But I had uh, springtails and isopods there. And the first time I put springtails in, she went bananas like they were fruit flies and and killed mm -hmm. all of them. <laughs> she killed and ate all of them. So then I added some more further from the nest and mm -hmm. then they were just booming. They were everywhere in there. She left them alone. But I think I put them too close to the nest too. Where they were just like maybe defense yeah. mode. Um, but I have done, uh, she's got springtails now, but that's it. So and then when they get in the water, the fish eat them. So that's kind of fun. The white cloud mountain minnows love the springtails. But uh, yeah, that's I, I do try to get springtails into into all of my setups when I had them. They all had springtails in their in their thing. I don't know that you could do it with like a. Uh, I don't know what you would use for a cleanup crew with like uh, Pocono Myrmix because they like it very very dry, in my experience. Yeah, they do, and the the dryness also prevents their uh, seed caches from rotting, Rolling. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, really, because they have such a dry environment, you really really wouldn't need a cleanup crew, because and again, true. most uh, yeah, most ants they won't uh, they won't defecate in their nest chambers themselves, or they might just Ooh. dedicate one specific area. And again, they they like clean. They're very clean animals. They're like social cats. They'll bring all their waste out of the nest for the most part. I find actually, if I, uh, here, I'll, I'll show you here. Like, I use uh, little uh, juice caps. Okay. They'll put oh, their yeah. waste. Like, like, this is from the uh, the Tetramorium. I've got dandelion seeds I feed them for uh, their carbs right now with sure. a little bit of the honey. But they'll put all their waste, any of the, any of their dead ants, any other dead insects or anything, they'll actually put into their sugar water bowls and i don't know why but they maybe figured out that, that that's how it gets clean almost like a like i said they're like social cats they use it like their litter box they know it's going to get clean so that's where they uh that's where they go <laughs> it's funny, and they'll balls. figure that out they'll figure that out so my um trick of mermix the little tiny leaf cutters would carry their dead ants around forever so i don't know how far they want to go 
to get rid of their dead ants. But they would carry, you'd see one carry a corpse for like the entire time I watched them. Yeah. And it's kind of a, it's a survival, uh, survival thing, right? Like the more your nest smells like insect corpses, like look at these, these guys pile up in the corner, right? Oh, On yeah. the opposite side. Oh, yeah. There's some dead cockroaches that I haven't cleaned out yet that they haven't moved by the nest entrance. But everything okay. else is up in that corner. So they'll pile everything far as far away as they can so they don't attract predators. Uh, sure. Rival ant colonies, right, to the nest. So they'll do what they can to get it as far away as possible just for their own, for their cleanliness and for the safety of the colony. Um, Aunt Sandy's asking about beetles. I don't know that I would use beetles based on that a beetle might burrow in. Any beetle that they couldn't murder has the opportunity to like burrow into the nest maybe and get at the larva. And, yeah, the my fear would be that they get into the the brood chambers and they would eat the pupa and the larva. Yeah, because they could go, they could do a lot of damage in a short amount of time. Yeah. To your population, and then it's hard. Like like my pogo queen, I don't think she's ever gonna lay eggs again. I think I just have a pet queen. Oh, so, no. I'm hoping she does. I've given her protein. I've given her honey. I've given her everything I can. She's got seeds. Um, but yeah, I don't. It's been a couple months now, and I don't see any more eggs. Yeah. Cohabitating so, ants with trilo trilobites? I don't know what a trilobites is. Trilobites? 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 Aren't they Those aquatic? Are aquatic. Yeah, trilobites are aquatic. So they, I, they would... I wonder if he's talking about the, the beetles. The trilobite beetles. Trilobite, trilobite beetles, maybe. I don't know if you can keep those, though. I don't think we've hacked... Uh, well, they're firefly larvae, technically. Female fireflies. Oh, okay. Well, they, don't, need those. they don't go through their adult form. Yeah. Keep them. Find I a way know. to start I their haven't really, I haven't really uh, experimented outside of springtails and small isopods for cleanup crews. But... Yeah, I don't know. There are some species of ants that do, uh, they cohabitate. I can't remember what the, uh, the scientific term is, but there's some species of ants that actually keep micro crickets around. I think you yep. were talking about them at some point too. They're almost yeah. like the ants' pets. They just live in the nests and the, the ants will feed them. And Mikey had kinda... those on uh, Ants Canada. He had those in one of his colonies. Yeah. 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 And that was really cool to see. Uh, there was like a dozen of them or something. They were breeding. Yeah, something. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the the crickets either but yeah it was kind of cool i wish I, there might be something up in like here in north america but i'm not too sure because mikey nets canada is in uh, the philippines so slightly yeah, different yeah. species there there is a species of ice pod that is um like symbiotic with ants it looks like a dwarf white i i don't know the difference i couldn't tell you mm -hmm. they don't look any different to me um the isopodchick.com she gets them from time to time um, I had that with Sheila. I haven't seen one in about a year. I don't know that that means they're gone, but I haven't seen one in about a year. But there were like 200 that I put in there. So, and I they were in the nest. I introduced them directly into the chambers and they were fine. Um, but I don't, I haven't seen them since. I would imagine they'd be booming if they were still there. So they may not have survived the isopod purge. They may have become <laughs> the protein for the masses, but uh, yeah. 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 Hoffman Segai, Platyarthus Hoffman Segai. Oh, that's the, okay, that's the one. All right, thanks, Tennyson. Platyarthus Hoffman Segai. They're not big. Don't think because it says Hoffman Segai that they're big. They are teeny. Myrmisophilidae. Rod Sprague is here. Or Sprague? Rod Sprague. I think he said it's like egg. Yeah. Um, and I know there, there are species of rove beetle too that'll uh, coexist in certain ant colonies too. I find them all the time with Laceus and Formica. Yeah. Within the chambers. Uh, a lot of actually the velvet mites, so the bigger, I think they're sometimes called clover mites. The red the, ones? The big, the big red velvety ones. Like they're yeah. half a centimeter in size sometimes. I find them a lot of times in with uh, ant colonies as well. So, okay. Uh, beetle guy, as far as substrate, I just used my isopod substrate. Uh, mixed with, I have plants in here now in the 100 gallon, so I have potting soil mixed with, like mm. organic potting soil mixed with my isopod substrate that I do. So yeah, you'll, um, you'll want, like Josh said there, like a substrate that is substantial enough that it'll maintain shape when you uh, hydrate the, 
the soil if you're looking to do a, a nest with substrate in it. Yeah. That way you don't collapse the tunnels and it has a little bit more of a uh, moisture retention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only yeah. tunnels I've ever seen collapse on these are when they dry out. So, but mm -hmm. this keeps them really moist. So uh, they're fine, uh, almost up to the top. Um, but yeah, I would, I would just use your isopod substrate. I used in the chamber over there in the pot on the on the right. I have uh, from, uh, oh my god, isopods anonymous, and then in this one is my blend because it's more for plants. This one is more for the ants. This one is more for plants. So um, I'm sure that it would grow just fine on Isopods Anonymous soil, but I couldn't afford anymore. <laughs> so that's what they got over there for the plants. Um, but yeah, you want something. I mixed in a little cocoa core, not a lot, like a mixing cup full into like 10 pounds of su uh, substrate soil um, just to give it a little more structure like that'll give it a little more structure too yeah so right does that make sense do you keep any in a substrate mix or no me no i'm not not right now i haven't ventured that far out i will eventually mm -hmm. once i get some larger colonies i just just for visibility reasons i like using these guys so once i get more sure. into the thousands i'll start doing a few setups like that and i'll experiment with more substrates to see what works best yeah but it's then I, I just keep these for the visibility. They're great for the shows and when I'm just talking about ants, right? It's it's hard to, to show off an ant colony that's blocked off their, their walls with uh, substrate. You can't ever see them except when they're on top. So, Boy, and they yeah. sure do. This setup here, boy, they have blocked a lot of chambers with dirt because I gave her dirt like an idiot and everybody told me not to. Um, beetle guy, you could use excavator clay. I don't know in the outworld, I would use it, I wouldn't use it as a nest right. area. Yeah, I did it in the outworld for uh, for a colony of formica. It wasn't these guys, but they uh, they burrowed into the excavator clay and then they were gone. So you can even see here they've used the uh, just the sand that was kind of oh, textured yeah. on the plaster and they just they block it out because they don't like light. <laughs> so even on the nests that are built to be visible at all times, they start to block it off. So if you do a pure substrate nest, you'll never see your call, your ants because they'll just block it off. Yeah, you don't see yeah. them underground. I, I don't see very much underground activity or, or like tunnel activity. Um, yeah, you'll see the above. Yeah, which is good. Like that's why I have the, you know, the sky thing, the, the canopy, so I can see the feeding mm -hmm. trails. I do get to see that that most people don't get to see in their little setups. Um, but I'm still trying to convince my friend here, Scott, to do a setup where he has a, a, for, a setup, uh, the, the Tar Heel Ants on the top of that entertainment center thing, and then tubes running to another shelf so he could do an outworld or two. And I will. Just yeah. Go, Shh. yeah, I did that with uh, my Campanotas for most of the summer, kind of, with into okay. this outworld. So they were using this out world until they went into their uh, pre diapause there. But I only had it from there across to here. But I can definitely if next year when they're active again, I can do something funky sure. and crazy and have a couple out worlds. You have to. I want to get one that goes across with one of these formica that goes from here to here, like 10 feet mm -hmm. and watch that just in the tubes in the clear tubes and have the, you know, an out world over here, maybe another out world over there. Um, and offer them different things and see what they go for. Yeah. Like, oh, here's some apple and here's a roach. Let's see what they do. So which yeah, one definitely. fills up first? <laughs> and that's the thing, like a lot of ant species, they actually like to travel long distances for their foraging. Yeah. Carpenter ants, they'll, they'll go for a, like a kilometer from their nest in some instances wow. to get to their foraging. Wow. To their foraging. <clears throat> Uh, some formica species, especially the parasitic ones, which are ones that raid for brood from other nests, sure. they'll sure. they'll they're, they'll they'll span kilometers as well. But they'll have their main nest, then they'll have a satellite nest and another satellite nest, and each satellite nest will have queen or queens living in there. So it's one super colony. Actually, David Attenborough does a really good. Uh, documentary on it empire of the ants it's about okay. uh formica it's like formica rufa in um in europe 
I think it's Rufa. But anyway, and it documents the, the super colonies, and it's really cool. So check that out. Empire of the Ants. Uh, Curse Geist. Uh, 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 what's that science channel with the like animations? Curse Geist, I think is the name of it. Oh, Kazergistag or whatever. Yeah, they yeah, do yeah. a cool one on slaver ants and that as well. The mega they have a great. They have a couple different ones in the mega col the super mega colony that's like expanded to the world or something. It, like genetically, it's the same ant. So they're everywhere. Oh, Frank showed the up finally. Yeah. Um, yeah, super mega colony. But uh, yeah. all right, we're gonna wrap it up a little bit because we're already at our our basically our limit, and it's probably yeah. like what Thursday there right now. <laughs> Where you're at. <laughs> Yeah, I, I missed a day of work. <laughs> uh, guys, do you have any follow-up, any final questions that we didn't cover yet? I know everybody's dying to keep ants now. They are not as hard. I think we made it I out to be it harder than it is. Harder. It's not hard. Yeah. Well, the, the founding stage for sure. If you're, I would honestly recommend for a beginner to even just buy a small colony. Again, from a trusted source. So my number one yeah. for anybody in the States would be from Tar Heel Ants. Yep. I they're there he's mac is awesome and he and has anybody, like max one of the yeah. guys that has like 10 different species that he can ship out everywhere but hawaii and florida i think in alaska um, as long as like the main continent yeah yeah so he has like i think it's 10 species now that he can ship out so you have a choice Good. yeah so definitely reach out to mac at Tar heel ants if you're looking into it because like i said you all your chance of success with a mature colony is far greater than starting out alone I would still say, for the experience, do you catch a few single queens just so you can kind of get that, yeah. that as well? Because it is very rewarding when you do get a colony from a single queen to the hundreds to the thousands. I haven't ever had it happen, so I'm hoping these three have nanitics. So this could be it for me. This could be a big deal, but they could still go. Yeah. Um, Only, so, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, like, only three or four of my all my queens that I've caught have actually gotten to full size colonies, the ones I haven't sold anyway. So, like, the success rate is really low. Sometimes the colonies just don't grow, but that's just part of the hobby. Yeah, yep, it is. It happens, or you'll get one that wasn't uh, wasn't inseminated, and they just give males. They just make infertile they just make males. males. A good example so. there would be one you can't really see her, but one down there. I brought her as an example, but I didn't bring her out. One that still has wings. Ninety percent chance she hasn't mated yet and won't ever produce. Yeah, if they don't lose their wings, that's a good sign. Um, what is it that intrigues you the most about keeping ants? Uh, just their social structure, really, and that every colony and every ant kind of has its own personality. So I can just sit there and watch them do their own thing do their thing all day every day because like some ants like they're like almost like people where like you have your little your introverted ones you've got one that seems to be like super excited about everything and everybody's like what's your problem and i don't know you just reach out like you can just sit there and watch them and yep. every and kind of has a personality even the queens will all have kind of their own personality See you, Beetle. yeah i just i just love watching them they're to me they're like they're far more entertaining than watching fish. And I think yeah, so too. Just, well, it's yeah. a different kind of entertaining. I think it's a different. It kind is of a different kind of entertaining. But yeah, yeah. just the overall, their 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 activities, just watching them clean each other, feed each other, raise the brood, follow They're always doing something. Food trails. Yeah, I love like putting up, especially when you have them in a big out world like that. The first time that they get food out of hibernation, or the first time an anidic finds honey how excited they get and then just run back and then just the the surge from your handful of workers to your hundreds of workers i just think it's so cool how they communicate via their chemicals and i'm gonna have to yeah. set up a camera on one of these globes and see because yeah. when i put a food item in there they're not always on that thing so to be able to time it like maybe a fast time thing where you see them like oh this one found it let's see how long it takes it to where you can't even see the food item anymore Mm -hmm. It's not long. I'll tell you, it's less than 20 minutes. Um, what did Rod say? Rod says they they tunnel through the... Oh, this is... Um, sorry. Harvester ants. What effect they had on atomic waste. They tunnel through the insoluble clay and thatch the nest with the, with the, what? With the most radioactive material. What? Hmm. That's even cooler than isopods. 
How long will a, a non-mated queen live for? Not too long. Uh, think. Not too long. So you'll probably get a couple years out of it, or maybe. I find a lot of them will die within a few weeks, but some will survive, especially if you're feeding them. They'll, they'll live their life, but they won't live as long as a mated queen. Something with their physiology. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that turns a switch on or something. Yeah. Um, but I imagine if you kept them fed, uh, they'd live a while. They live a while. Like you'll see, like some species, like Myrmica and even Pogonomyrmix, they will have uh, mated queens that take on worker roles. So actually, okay. I have, okay. I have a uh, a Manica rubra queen that I've boosted with Myrmica brood, and some of those brood actually hatch into queens, oh, and wow. the queens oh, wow. off their wings, and they've just taken up worker roles. But they'll their lifespan will maybe be slightly longer than just a, a your typical worker okay okay well that's one that's never flown either though that's a little bit different it's yeah it's different yeah but yeah that's cool that's cool. i haven't had any uh i thought i would have um elates by now which elates are the yeah. queens and kings i yeah, thought i would have had elates by now i'm kind of disappointed that i don't I i'm don't not surprised you haven't but yeah yeah maybe next year but they, they're they really like you they're they're protein protein uh, dependent like they will wipe out your colonies protein sources because your uh, your workers will give preference to the elites when they're feeding them okay. so they're just uh they're a resource sump basically once well, also i don't out. want i don't want a thousand elites flying around in my house <laughs> So, yeah, that would be something with it. Your open top, yeah, that would be uh, interesting. Oh, sure. I would, uh, yeah, I would need a good attorney. My wife would, she would straight up leave me. <laughs> yeah, but that is something that actually uh, Zach with Canada Colony is trying to do, and he's trying to uh, artificially, artificially breed ant colonies. So he wants he wants colonies to get up in size where they have their own, um, almost said an index um elites and then breed within his own kept colonies so he can just produce new mated queens in house rather than always having to go out and find new ones it's something yeah. that i've always wanted to do here too but my colonies just they're taking forever to get up to a mature size to get to that point but it would be really cool to have uh in captivity nuptial flight because i don't think it's ever been documented anywhere so it'd be cool to be among the first <laughs> Like and I could get a nuptial flight, but they don't breed within their own colony, though, right? They kind of no. know. There, there, there are some tropical species that do, but I don't ask me the names. I think black crazy ants in the Philippines will inbreed, okay. but that's because every queen is a different, uh, technically a different uh, biological makeup, so they can without it actually being inbreeding. Huh? That's wild. There's so many adaptations. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, now I'm going to have nightmares about nuptial flights. I'm going to be keeping an eye on her now. <laughs> like, where's those babies? All right, we need some fly tape in this basement right now. Um, Because, yeah, who wants that? Who wants like a thousand ants flying around? Sundews. Frank said sundews would eat them. Sundews. There you go. Just get a, just get a thousand sundews in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. During one of the escapes, I put down that sticky paper over one of the trails yeah. that they were doing and it was it literally filled up with ants like that's how bad they escaped i didn't realize how many had escaped feed the elates to the herps i don't have any herps really i want to get a toad i heard that our toads will eat them bufo, bufo. yeah and they'd, they'd be good for uh dart frogs too especially the drones because they're smaller you think so yeah. Lacius drones for sure oh yeah oh Lacius. yeah Lacius yeah yeah, yeah thousands of drones when they launch their flights so yeah cast those up and if you have dart frogs or anything small like that they'd love them okay all right i was thinking about dart frogs any kind of frog really yeah. yeah anything that eats fruit flies would eat uh drones for sure i came up with in my head the concept for a setup to do uh yeah. well i kind of stole it to do for uh horn toads but okay, yeah. uh you would need like five mature colonies to sustain one horn toad yeah for sure actually uh one of the uh the ladies at the last reptile show they breed uh dart frogs they were they wanted a couple colonies as a food source for their 
dart frogs. Okay. But nothing up here breeds fast enough, like produces workers fast enough because they wanted the workers to feed the, the dart frogs and whatnot. But nothing okay. here produces fast enough. You'd need something like uh, your invasive fire ants, red invasive fire ants. Yeah. I'd be nervous feeding fire ants to my my thing. Yeah, so I wouldn't well, use pogos yeah. because pogos are like specifically toxic pogos to reptiles. Yeah. 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 So that would or be they could, or they would provide the uh, the frogs with that the, whatever enzyme they need to make their skin <laughs> or their secretions toxic, right? So you gotta be careful there too. <laughs> Either yeah. the ants would kill your frogs or your frogs would kill you. The frogs would kill you. <laughs> I yeah, like that so. myth. You can still handle them as long as you don't have any uh, cuts on you. You're good. Just don't like your fingers after. Yeah, you'll be good. <laughs> yeah. I saw a special like 30 years ago where the guy went to the village. Is you know, some British guy went to some African village where they use like porcupine quills and blow the dart at monkeys. And uh, that's literally what it was. I'm not like making things up. But they so they take a frog, the dart frog, and they spear it to this porcupine quill and then they roast it over the fire and then that's the toxin and so they showed the guy they're like no it's very bitter and the guy just like puts it in his mouth and tastes it and so the host did and the guy goes yeah if your gums aren't bleeding or anything you'll be fine and uh or, or like a canker sore he <laughs> <It> was like because <laughs> if you have one of those it gets in your bloodstream you're just dead you're like, done <laughs> just put it in your blood <laughs> what the oh hell? My God. <laughs> yeah so uh that's a nightmare but yeah, there's that. But anyway, uh, Scott, I think we're done with questions. Uh... Hopefully I didn't just ramble on mindlessly and talk about large isn't always bigger and stuff like that for the whole show. But That was that was a great quote. That was a great quote. Of all the quotes <laughs> you, you had tonight. Feel free to use uh, any of those quotes <laughs> to haunt me for the rest of my life. I don't mind. I don't think it's that bad. Um, but I do have to tease you about it as an older American brother. Um no, I think we learned a lot. I think everybody learned plenty about so. how to keep ants and knows where to find you now if they have any more questions. So, um, guys, if you're even remotely interested, get an ant colony. Like like he said, mm -hmm. buy one from a trusted source. I bought Sheila on eBay. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so she came with 20 workers. That's how she showed up at my door. Um, and that was enough to make her a totally viable colony by herself. She still took some TLC repeatedly um but yeah yeah it was really really good so it worked out for me obviously but uh for starters that's what you want to do but like like you said scott try to catch a couple queens i happened to catch these three i wasn't looking i happened to catch these three one day yeah sometimes that's the best the best chance of finding a queen is when you're not looking hence why i said yeah. at the beginning i have catch cups everywhere so <laughs> literally yeah. if i find one she's caught yeah but it's easy you can just uh I mean, that's it. That's all you need is a catch cup, some cotton balls, a test tube. You don't really need a test tube, but again, yeah, by the time you get like five workers, it's going to be almost impossible to keep them in that little cup. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, because they're just going to be like, oh, fresh air. Once that air hits them, I think that's a, a thing to have them freak out a little bit. Yeah. Well, it's a change in their environment, right? So they get defensive. And I think what I think really we, th we see it as stupidity, but really they're the distraction right like you know how like a the ducks they'll fly away from oh, the, yeah, nest, yeah. the young to distract from the more vulnerable so they're they're putting their lives at risk to protect the queen and the brood because they're disposable where the queen if she's gone that's it right yep that's the colony so now nanitics are still just stupid but uh <laughs> Playing devil's advocate there. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know you were talking about nanitics specifically. I just wanted to point out yeah. they are still very, well, very that, dumb. Yeah. Uh, get a colony. Find out. I'll, I'll try to film some nanitic antics. <laughs> Nanantics? I don't Nanantics? know. Nanantic? Niantic? Isn't that a game company? Or something? Anyway, uh, I'll try to get some good nanitic uh, stuff on film and see if we can do that. I want to see if that one it closed yet. I think I have two. Oh, I got another one. They're going to tear him open. Sorry, that's that's Edna. She's got three already. Let's see what we got here. But they have another uh, one of the other cocoons is brown. They're going to have six nanitics in like three days. All six. Okay, let's see. Does she have two full nanitics yet? Nope. He's close. 
He's getting there. You probably won't be able to see this. She's got one in her mouth. There's the there ninetic. And there's a little brown guy in there. Yeah, you can see the two cocoons there right under my eye. So she's got four cocoons. Well, they're not actually cocoons. I'll post some, I'll try to post some better pictures on ISO Buddies. But guys, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, again, we have a Patreon if you want to support the show. It's a really cool thing. Everybody's doing it. Um, teenagers doing it, and they seem pretty on the ball. So, Futurama quote. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, support what we do. I mean, we're here. We're entertaining you. Support Scott. I don't know how you would. He's in Canada. Um, support Tar Heel. Uh, I think. Yeah, support our Tar Heel Lance if you're in the states. If you're in, if you're in Canada, support uh, Canada Colony. If you're in Alberta specifically, hit me up. I'll uh, I'll hook you up with some ants, some colonies. Come visit us at the reptile shows. Yeah, yeah, do it, guys. Support your local guys yeah, or girls, whatever. Support Aunt girls. Sandy. She's got the skinks. Three to five hundred bucks, up to one hundred twenty-five dollars off. Code ISO buddies. Um, guys, we'll see you next week. Uh, I don't know who the guest is going to be next week. We don't have anything really lined up next month. We're going to talk with Asheville Wild Sides next month about scorpions. Finally, we're going to do scorpions. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the month, the last Tuesday of the month, we're going to have Eddie, Edwin Lopez, crazy Eddie, uh, or easy Eddie on here again. We're going to talk about setting up ice pod bins, uh, the right way, the insane way, which is what Eddie does. He takes it to a super new level. Um, and I'm going to get him to talk about the hot, the new hotness in the hobby, whatever's awesome. So uh, stay tuned. And I will keep you posted on the ISO Buddies Facebook page on what's coming up. Okay. Uh, I'll talk to you later. Love you. Thank you, Scott, for coming on. Always a pleasure. And everybody else, uh, have a great night. And I hope you have a jaguar. All right. Have a jaguar.